are you today? Well, welcome. If you're joining us online, we are glad that you have chosen Vineyard Online Service. Uh, we think God has something great for you, that He has a good plan for you. And we want to unpack that. We discover that by going to His Word, right? I mean, that's, that's our, our instruction manual, our recipe, uh, where we say, God, show us how to, how to live this life, how to live a life of fulfillment. Now, we've been in a series, we're actually ending it, uh, this series on You Asked For It, where we did a survey and we got responses on things that we can talk about. And so we've been talking about uh, things that you guys asked for, at least a number of you. We kind of took the top ones. And, and today we're going to be talking about uh, another uh, angle of stress and dealing with that, and that's the issue of balance, that having balance in our lives, that's... that's that's probably more of an art than a science. It's hard to get balanced. And, to, and then if you are in balance, to stay in balance. And we see that God talks about it all throughout Scripture. Let's begin with this verse. You made my body, Lord. Now give me sense. That'd be another form of balance. <laughs> sense to heal your, heed your loss. So God actually tells us, hey, here's, I have some things that if you do uh, these, th these things in your life, you'll have more balance in your life. Like I said, we'll look at it. And, and you really see that uh, this issue of, uh, of, of balance or, um, uh, 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 you know, equilibrium, uh, it's symmetry. It's, you see this in, in, in the sciences. You see it in nature, this idea of balance, like the ecosystem. There's, that needs to be balanced, and uh, there, scientists are always trying to figure that out. Well, Sharon and I went to um, uh, Yellowstone Park last year, and first time we had been there. And one of the things that we learned was that the lake, Lake Yellowstone, that got way out of balance, all because some anglers decided to add some trout that wasn't in there. I think they added lake trout, and what was in there before was cutthroat trout. And, and there was a beautiful balance with the cutthroat trout because they were big trout that kind of hung at the surface. The eagles could come in. Actually, I, like, I think like 16 different bird species could, could get them, and then, they, and then the bears could get it, and the wolves. Would, you know, there's like this ecosystem balance. And, so, and these anglers put in this other kind of fish that go way down to the bottom. None of the, nobody could, all the animals couldn't get to them. And so it threw it all off balance and the wolves started dying and the bears went away and the eagles died and totally out of whack, out of balance. Because balance is, 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 is important, right? I mean, bridges that are designed, they're designed, hopefully, where they're, they're balanced so that when the waves or the winds and all the pressures that come along, that they don't, that they don't, crack and fall apart. A number of years ago, I went to a Washington National Cathedral. That was, it took 80 years to build that. And one of the things that they, that they talked about was these flying buttresses that, that cathedrals really became a thing when they came up with this uh, structural uh, balance idea of flying buttresses where it would, it would balance the stress load across multiple, uh, uh, you know, the multiple pillars. And, 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 and so they could have these, these, huge, these huge edifices because of this principle of balance. Our bodies were made to live in balance. We have nine systems. We have the, the uh, digestive system, the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the skeletal system. I mean, all these systems. And when they're out of balance, there's disease there's we're sick right it's a problem and so we see over and over that balance is an important part of the way God made the world and certainly the way that he made us I love this verse we've looked at it a few times actually in this series because it's a it's a verse about about balance he says Jesus kept increasing and then there's these four areas where he had in balance wisdom you know, his intellect, his mental stature, which is physically favor with God, spiritually in favor with men, relationally, socially. All of those things kept in balance helps us as we 
you know, that's part of heeding God's law. It helps us to do well in life. It says, it is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night. God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. So he's not talking about sleep per se. I mean, sleep is included, but rest. In other words, and what's he talking about? Work and rest. He's saying there needs to be balance. Balance. Life is not all work and certainly not all rest. It's a balance. And when we get the proper rest work balance, he goes, then that's, that's smart living. So I want to look at seven principles of balance this morning. Seven principles based on God's word. And it kind of follows the word balance. Okay, that's an acronym. Uh, first is build my life on Christ. Reason why that's so important is because nobody is is perfectly in balance except for Jesus. The only person who's ever lived a life perfectly in balance is Jesus. So it makes sense that if you put Jesus as the center of your life, you're going to be more likely to live a life of balance. And so we look to Christ. We read the Gospels. We read God's Word. And we're looking for balance, to, you know, because God talks about it. It says, Jesus said, God will give you all you need from day to day. That's good to know. I want to know, how do, how do I get all I need each day? He says, if you live for God and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. So how do I do that? Well, really, we have all of these obligations, a circle of obligations. We're trying to juggle them all. And we're trying to say, well, God, how do I keep you in the center? How do I keep you, you know, first place and in focus? Well, what we talk about a lot here at Vineyard is, is, is you can't do it all. So you, each one of us has a next step. We have a next step. I have a next step. You have a next step. How do you know your next step? Well, your next step in all likelihood, is something you have been neglecting. And if you were to really address it and say and face it head on, you'd say, that really is my next step. It's easier to do this. And you, I think that's my next step, because that's the easier thing. But our next step often is the thing that, we, that we've been neglecting and actually will bring us the greatest results on investment, the greatest ROI. Let me give you an illustration. You know, those... Back in the day, they used to have the big barrels where they'd put rum in them. I think they still put rum in them. But anyways, the big barrels, right, with the, with the wooden slats. Here's a picture of it. Big barrel, right? Big, two big bands. And you have the wooden slats. If this was your life and you were going to fill it up with water, which is kind of like all the things you're, you know, all, all the stresses of life. And I put here the minimum, because it's actually used in business and in education and counseling as this, the law of the minimum. In other words, what, are you, what, what is causing the biggest problem, and for you to get the biggest ROI, is to address the one that has the lowest slat. Those slats come up, they're called staves, and some of them are in need of repair in our lives. Uh, it's the areas where we're out of balance, and some are lower than others. But if you're trying to fill that bucket up, how high are you going to be able to get to the lowest slat? There's a better picture of it. To the lowest slat. That's where you're going to get the greatest ROI, the greatest results on investment of your time and your money and your energy. If you address that. Often, though, as I said, the reason it's the lowest one, it's the lowest one is because we've neglected it. We don't like it. For some of you, that lowest slat is your spiritual life. Your greatest the greatest thing you could do is start praying or coming to Saturday morning prayer, do, getting prayer in your life, or starting to read the Bible. You know, doing something, address, because you're just, you're going day after day, you're neglecting that. That's an area of neglect. Or coming to church. You're going, Andy, I'm here. Well, you're here today. <laughs> you know, come and making that a regular part of what you do. For others of you, you're doing great on those fronts. You, you're neglecting your health. You're not eating right, you're not exercising, you're not, you're, and that's, that's, and you're thinking, well, that's not that important. What's your lowest slat? It, the reason why it's lowest is because you, that's your value right now, is it's not important. And so you neglect that. And so the, the great, the, the thing that you need to address, your next step is that. Others of you, it might be your families or something at work, you know, your career. 
whatever the lowest slat is, that's that's what you need. That's your your that's and more more than likely that's your next step. It's the very thing that you don't want to do though. But if you want to bring balance into your life, hello, am I on? Yeah, Yeah, I'm back on. Okay. So, great verse, great verse. Jesus summarizes in two sentences the whole Bible, in a way. Look at what he says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. This is the first and greatest commandment. Okay, that's number one. Number two. And the second, love your neighbor. That's act, there's actually three in here. As yourself. Three. If we want balance, you got to have, I'm, I'm addressing, I want to have a close relationship with God. I want to care for people around me, particularly people that are in my sphere of influence. People that are, you know, if you're a boss, you know, your employees, if you're a parent, your kids, if you're a uh, uh, an adult child of an older parent, maybe it's that person, uh, you know, the people that, you know, need us. And then, in, in a general, everybody, but not exist. You're part of everybody. You don't, ex- you don't exclude you. So that's an important part of this, that you love God, you love people, you love yourself. You love yourself. And that's part of bringing balance into your life. Number two is accept my humanity. In other words, you don't pretend that you have all the answers, that you can solve everybody's problems. You realize that there's, uh, there's limitations in yourself, also with other people. Other people drop the ball all the time. And so, you, you know, you have to often lower your expectations. It makes you a happier person, you know, when you're, and you're more accepting. You're more accepting of yourself, generally. Often when we're real harsh with other people, it's because we're harsh with ourselves. And, so, and, and if we're out of balance, we're l- more likely to be to not have the margin to give to somebody else. People that drop the ball, people that irritate us, th- usually they irritate us like that. If we're out of balance, the irritation goes like that. And so we're reacting in a different way than we would if we were not out of balance. And so we want to make sure that we uh, recognize our humanity. Only someone who's too stupid to find his way home, that's pretty blunt, right? would wear himself out with work. In other words, he's saying, some of us think we can solve all the problems in our lives if we just roll up our sleeves and work harder. But the truth is, there's some things that are, that are there's some things we can control. Most of that's with ourselves. Some things we can influence. Some things we can't influence or control at all. Recognizing that and, and, and just kind of resigning as general manager of the universe. You know, hey, listen, there's most of this stuff, which is most of life. I can't control that stuff. And so I'll never find peace. I certainly won't be in balance if I'm all caught up trying to, um, you know, solve all those things. And and, because there's, it's part of humanity. Here's a great way I think the Bible describes the frailty of humanity. He says, we are like common clay jars. Another translation says we're like cracked pots. Have you ever, right? I didn't use that translation, so I figured clay jar was soft enough that carry the glorious treasure. We have Christ in us. It's remarkable that when we invite the living God inside, when we invite him into our life, into our heart, he dwells in us. That's why it's so special. He goes, but in comparison, it's a clay jar. He's not devaluating the clay jar. He's just saying that's frail humanity. It still has incredible value because what it contains. And so don't look down on it. Just recognize, you know, it's, it's fra- it, it's, it, it'll, it'll, it can break. It can crack. So this immeasurable power will be seen in God and not in ourselves. And so we handle it with care because we realize it's, it's, there's, it's frail. Limit my labor. So working is important. Working is a value that that we see in Scripture, that we work for, has a lot of positive things. But sometimes we overwork. And for all kinds of reasons. If you're self-employed, there's a tendency to overwork. You know, you work and then you have all this extra work and then you bring it home and you're working on weekends and, and that can cause an out of balance. You're neglecting other things. Maybe your health, maybe your family. 
And so taking the time to have balance and, and scheduling things so that you have balance in your life. And you might even need accountability. You know, ask some people in your life, hey, I think I'm overworking. Sometimes if we're a workaholic, we don't even know it. Here's, here's a hint, okay? A couple, I just, there's many of them, but here's some hints. You know you're a workaholic when all your Christmas cards come from business associates, right? They're all pre-printed. You're, when, when you, he, you know you're a workaholic when you head out uh, to back the school night and you don't even know what school your kids go to. You know you're a workaholic when your family refers to you as occupant. You know, you know you're a workaholic when you unwind immediately after work by watching James Corden's The Late Late Show. You know you're a workaholic when you get sick it, it take, you have to get sick to take time off, or you know you're a workaholic when you catch up on your emails on the toilet. <laughs> Great opportunity to catch up on emails. There might be a problem. You might want to rethink that. Now, resting ourselves, getting balance, particularly juxtaposed to work, is, is in the Ten Commandments. It's in the Ten Commandments. The Fourth Commandment, this is how important it is. It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. He says, observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which you can work, but the seventh day is going to be a day of rest dedicated to me. And so he, he lists it up there, because sometimes we think, oh, church and rest for a day, that's, just, you know, that's a good suggestion, you know, but that's not the life I'm living. It's along with murder and lying and you know, all these other commandments. And he goes, hey, a day of rest is, helps you stay in balance. The first three of the Ten Commandments are, are, are giving attention to God. It's the, the, then the Fourth Commandment, which is the one we're looking at, the other ones are all about how we treat other people. Out of all the ten, only one is, hey, this is for you to help you stay in balance in your life. What does Sabbath mean? Day rest. Pretty simple. But what do you do on that? It's a day of rest. What do you do? Well, you catch up on all the things you couldn't do on the other six, right? No, no. It says the Sabbath was made for the sake of people and not for people for the sake of the Sabbath. So the Sabbath is not something we're enslaved to. We have to do it. It's, uh, it, it's something we get to do, something, not something we have to do. And God designed it so that it helps us stay in balance and we go through life in a better way. And you, it doesn't have to be Sunday. For a lot of people, it is. But the Bible says, Therefore, we do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a Sabbath day. Some people, their Sabbath is a different day, but it's every six days, and it's every week. For me, so Sunday is not my Sabbath. I work hard on a Sunday. And so, <laughs> and so Friday is my Sabbath. It used to be Monday for years. But it switched it around. But you can choose. You don't have to have a particular day. But you realize, hey, my Sabbath is important. It's something God gave me. And it's in the Ten Commandments. And it's important. What do I do? Well, three things. First of all, I want to make sure and rest my body. I was going to put in care for my body. But they're all start with an R. So I, I, I thought, well, I can't change it. You know, I, I've got a problem. I've got issues with that. But so... <laughs> But you, you're caring for your body, you're resting your body. Uh, that's so important because we, we need that to, to rest our body. A number of years ago now, uh, I worked at Costco. I, worked, I got my job at Costco when I was at, in, in Tucson, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona. When I transferred here uh, to go to school, I ended up transferring with Costco. I ended up working there for nine and a half years. And several of the years, I was a forklift driver. So forklift driver just kind of, that's, that's a big part of what they do there. And uh, the manufacturers of the batteries, now I don't know what kind of batteries they have today, but back in the day they didn't have lithium ion, but they were basically the same. I mean, 36 cells, you had to care for them. If you worked them too hard, they said no more than six hours or you would cause uh, damage, uh, un unrepairable damage. It would lower the, the battery uh, the life of the battery, it wouldn't last as long. But when we were under deadlines and we had all these kinds of things we needed to do, the, the managers would come up and say, hey, you, you, can, you can go past the six hours. We don't have time to charge them. We, you know, we're going to be opening soon or whatever was coming up. And so we'd go past the six, and, 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 and you could tell. I mean, the, 
I could, you know, you're sitting on top of 36 cells and all the, the, the not smoke, but like the acid, the, all the fumes of the acid is coming up. You can smell the burning and it's not working as well. And it causes problems with it. The man, you have a manufacturer and, he's, and, and your manufacturer says you need to rest. If you go beyond this point, you're going to cause damage. It might even be unrepairable damage. You have to build this in to your life. You know, during the French Revolution, they actually eliminated a day of rest. They just said, oh, people just can work. And the whole nation started getting sick. The nation, as a nation, became sick, and they had to reinstitute the Sabbath because it's the way we were designed. It was the way we were designed. Rest our bodies. Recharge your emotions. You can do that through quietness through solitude, soul reflection. You can also do that through relationships. Relationships are a great way to recharge our emotions, taking time for that. Also, recreation is another way to do that. Rejuvenating recreation and then also refocus your spirit. Now, the Bible word is worship. We give our attention to God. We focus on Him because He helps to realign the things that are important. Sometimes we feel all these Things are crashing in on us, and when we focus on God, we come and we sing those songs, and we think about the lyrics, and we do a Bible study, and, and we get encouraged and prayed for by people, and we just kind of walk away with a different perspective, like, hey, God's still in charge. He's still on the throne. I still have a future. Things aren't going to collapse. He's not going to let me drown. You know, he's not going to let me burn. I'm, he's going to see me through this. That's the power of you know, of, of getting our life in balance and letting God speak into it in that way. Then adjust my values. Now, part of getting out of balance often is getting our values out of balance. What we, what we want is important in our life. We kind of, we, we, we get lost in that. We start majoring on minors, things that aren't important to us. You know, we, I mean, that's why it's important to, um, to have something that grounds you. The Bible certainly is one of those things. It can ground you in your values. You, as you read, you're prayerfully kind of being confronted. This is what is important. Another way, uh, I'm not saying instead of the Bible, but in addition to the Bible, another way we can help balance ourselves in this area, in the area of values, is to, uh, something I do is I I'll ask myself, uh, it, will this matter in 10 years? Will this matter in 10 And a lot of times the answer is no. And it helps me to kind of cool off. Okay, step back, Andy. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, you know, or even better, will this matter in eternity? Uh, that certainly is a value changer. You know, but, but adjust our values. Getting, getting our, our values in line with how we're living our life. He says, I've learned why people work so hard. He's talking about values misplaced with work. So hard to succeed. It's because they envy things their neighbors have. Well, that certainly can be a reason. Most of us won't admit it, you know, but it feels good when other people, you know, ooh and ah, whoa, you took that kind of vacation. What, oh, that's so awesome. You know, and we want to try to keep up with the Joneses, you know, and do all the kinds of things. The, the funny thing is, is so often we try to impress people with money we don't have for people we don't even like. I mean, it's kind of dumb if you think about it. You know, I don't even like them, but I want to impress them. I, I, I would love it if they, you know, looked up to me and all the things I have, promotions and accolades and all that stuff. So, again, making sure my values are in the right place. I'm not getting swept up in the world, the world's values of having more, having something greater, having something better. And that becomes... You just get on the rat race if you do that. You know, even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. You know that, right? So you've got to be careful about that, you know. Just make sure we don't go down that road and know when enough is enough. Because Jesus said, what good is it for a man or a woman to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? He's talking about all of us have to make choices. We make choices each day and they add up. But he's... I like to say it this way, what, what does it profit a man to become president of his company or CEO and lose his family? 
What does it profit a woman to get that huge promotion and lose her family? It doesn't profit. It's not, a fair, it's not the trade you want to make. Jesus is saying, make sure you don't lose yourself in that and you don't get sucked into that. Sometimes it just comes from stuff we bring in from childhood. I mean, stuff kids say stuff to us on the playground. Maybe your parents said you're not good enough, you'll never amount to anything. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was a sibling. All, you know, and then we work and we find ourselves unconsciously working to prove them wrong. Sometimes even in our 40s and our 50s and our 60s. See, you're not, that wasn't true. And and that's motivating us, even at, when we're hurting ourselves in other areas. And so we, we, we recognize, hey, my identity is not tied, tied to my work. My identity, and that's a hard one. It's easy to say. But my identity is what God says about me. That I'm loved. I'm valued. I have a purpose. And God's spirit dwells in me. And he's going to empower me. He's going to give me peace. I mean, just I, you just tie in. You tether yourself to something different than all the things the world says will give you fulfillment and pleasure. Look at this verse. It is better to have only a little with peace of mind than to be busy all the time. Sometimes that's a value shift. At first, this past first Wednesday, we had S Steve Nicholson speak and his wife flew here as well with him. And um, oh, I loved it. It was great. I love First Wednesday. I love our small groups. But I, I was talk sharing. I went to dinner with the Nicholsons, and we were, or maybe it was lunch. But anyways, we were talking to them, and um, he's retired now. He, he, he been, pastored a vineyard church in Chicago for 45 years or something. He retired just like two or three years ago. And um, I'm still a little ways away, but I am asking more questions. So when I look for those moments, I like, you know, kind of like ask some questions. And I said, so how, how's things, you know, going? A lot of pastors don't have uh, a very good retirement uh, set up. And, uh, and so I asked him, I said, you know, are you doing okay? He goes, well, yeah, I don't have a big retirement. He goes, but actually, Cindy and I have committed, we're debt free, and we've committed to simple living. So we're actually living fine off of our Social Security check alone. That's all we get. And we're doing fine. So I, th I thought, you know what, there's some value in just having, you know, a, sim a simpler value instead of getting swept up in, in what the world says will make us happy. Also, nourish my inner life. I think this is easy to neglect because this is the thing that most people don't see. Sometimes we can just neglect it and but listen, you will know when you, don't, when you neglect it or not. God creates a passion in us. He gives us a dream, and we're supposed to be pursuing that dream, that goal, that passion. There's something that he wants you to be pursuing in life, that every time you get up in the morning, you, that's, that's, that's the, it's wind in your sails. You just get up, I can't wait to do this. But if we neglect that, that actually can become, instead of a fire, just a little flicker. In fact, if we neglect it long enough, it can actually go out. And then we're like zombies. We're just like going through the motions. Go one step, plodding in front of the next, going through life, going from one crisis in life to the next, really with no driving passion. You don't want to live that way. And so you don't, be careful not to neglect that. You can, you, you stoke the fires. You let God come and breathe on it. Here we see the Song of Songs. He says, I had no time for myself. That is somebody who is neglecting their inner life. If that verse resonates with you, that might be a, like a little light on your dashboard that you're neglecting your inner life and that you need to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and kind of breathe on that, create that fire. Look at this next verse. We already looked at it. It says, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. I bring it in again because I think it's easy to neglect this last part where we love, where we take, we care about ourselves. I'm not saying worship ourselves. I'm saying we care for ourselves and we don't get uh, in the place where we're just neglecting 
the things that are important about ourselves. Jesus often slipped away to be alone so he could pray. What's he doing? He's, he's, not, he's caring for his inner self, making sure he's, he's dialing in, saying, God, I want to, you know, Heavenly Father, I want to be doing what is most important. And that passion, making sure that passion stays there. It's one of the reasons we do growth track. Growth track is one of the ways we get to intersect with you and kind of inject passion into your dream. And so we encourage you, if you've not done Growth Track, or maybe you haven't done it in a while, or maybe you're floundering in your passion, even though you've done Growth Track, you probably need another, another shot. Come on in. We want to give you another injection of faith and passion, and, and, and watch what God does with that, because it's a big part of how we're supposed to live our lives of balance. Commit your daily schedule to God. Your daily schedule. Now, I'm specifically, I mean, I'm talking to everybody because we all fill our days with stuff, but I'm specifically talking to those of you who are list makers like me. Every day I have a list, whole list. Top three things I got to do and prioritize it all. And so once my list is set, interruptions become challenging for me, you know, because you know, so I've got to commit it to God so that because, you know what, I might have missed some things. God might have something he wants me to do that day that I didn't know was coming. And if I get too consumed with my little list, I could easily miss it. And so we commit it to God. God, this is your list. I remind myself of this verse. David says, my times are in your hands. God, this is your list. I want to be bendable. I want to be flexible. I want to be able to receive interruptions that come into my life. The Bible says there is time and season for everything under heaven. So I need to make sure I get that timing right. You know, one time uh, in the Gospels, Jesus is going to, to uh, heal somebody. Actually, this girl is dying. And on the way, he gets interrupted. Some lady with an issue of blood, 12 years, and she wants healing. But Jesus is like, man, that's on his list. I'm going there. But he's okay with his interruption. I'm not sure I would do so well. You know, I read that and I think, Jesus, that's, that's awesome, man. I mean, he's like totally as chill. Hey, okay, that will wait. This is what God, this is what the Heavenly Father is doing right now. He heals that woman and then he goes off. Everything works fine. I, I, you know, part of committing our, our, our time, our schedules to God is, God, I, I want to have eyes that I can see in the moment. Is this in our, not doesn't mean every interruption is something we're supposed to bring into our lives, but we just pause for a moment. God, is this an interruption I'm supposed to do with? Am I supposed to stop and help this person? Am I supposed to give them person uh, this, you know, some of my time, my energy, uh, because you know that means something else doesn't happen. And and if God whispers to your to your yes, then you do it. And then lastly, enjoy the moment for balance. Enjoy. God wants us to enjoy life. It's not just grin and bear it. It's not just uh, enduring life. God gives life as a gift to us. He says all of us should enjoy what we have worked for. It's God's gift. And so there's, there's many things that we've worked for that we certainly can enjoy if we get out of the, the when and then thinking. You know, the when and then thinking. If once I, it, you know, it's all about working hard. When I get this, then I'll be happy. You know, when I graduate, then I'll be happy. When I get that promotion, then I'll be happy. When I get, when I get married, then I'll be happy. When I have kids, then I'll be happy. When the kids move out, then I'll be happy. <laughs> I mean, it goes on and on. You know, when I get this, when I get that. And you can live your whole life never being happy, thinking that if I just, and you're happy for a moment, certainly, but it goes away real quick because then you get caught back up into the when and then and it'll be something else. And so enjoying where you're at. This, Hey, I, I, God, teach me to be satisfied and enjoy where I'm at today, not always living somewhere else, pursuing something else. You know, staying in the present is its own discipline. God, teach me to be in the present right now. Right, with this person, especially with people, right? A relaxed, at, or with God, staying in the presence with him. A relaxed attitude lengthens a person's life. He says, hey, you'll live longer. 
If you learn how to relax, you learn how to enjoy other people, you learn how to get a more balance in your life. I, I gave you that illustration of the barrel and the staves that were at different lengths. Let me give you a different illustration. You know, a wheel, a, you know, like especially like an uh, old-fashioned wheel or a bicycle wheel that has spokes, you have all those spokes, if that was your life, that would represent all the things that are going on in your life. You know, the power is generated from the hub where the axle connects to it. That's where all the power, and it distributes throughout all of the spokes. That's where it generates its power. If your life is like that wheel, and all of the spokes are all the obligations, all the things, your career, your dreams, you know, your, your family, your relationships, your schooling, all, the, the, all those spokes were that, whatever's in the center is what's going to generate the power. And you'll have something in the center. Everybody has something in the center, but if God is in the center, if that's your choice, I want God in the center, then you have God's power distributed throughout everything you're doing. That helps give you balance. That helps distribute the stress in your life so that you can have the things that we're talking about and enjoy what, the, the life that God's given you. And so it does begin there where you say, God, I want you in the center of my life. I love this verse here. Here's Paul in a season when he's under extreme pressure and stress. Here's what he says. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. That's a lot of stress. Maybe some of you are in that, that situation. Here's what he says. So much stress and pressure, we despaired even of our life. I think, you know, if you get under enough stress, you start to get hopeless. And if you live in that place long enough, it can just suck the joy out of your life. And if you're far from God and you're under enough stress long enough, you can start to feel like, you know what, it's not even worth it. Why am I even doing this? Well, God speaks to that. Paul didn't end up here. This is in a passage where he's talking about his feelings and what he's enduring and going through. Right after this, he talks about turning to Christ and get and being filled with, with, with God's power. And Jesus offers that. I love this last verse I, I want to end with today. He, he, he says, I want to do an exchange. Everybody who's under pressure, under stress, out of balance, here's his promise. It's an exchange. He says this, come to me, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. The very thing we're talking about. I'll give you rest. All of you who work so hard beneath a heavy yoke. He's talking about a burden. You know, that just something that just goes, it just weighs you down. You feel like you can't get free. He says, wear my yoke, for it fits perfectly. And let me teach you. He says, for I am gentle and humble, and you shall find rest for your souls. I give you only light burdens. The question that I ask myself, and I encourage you to ask yourself, is if you're under a heavy burden, well, you have to ask yourself, why are you staying there? Because that's a heavy burden, Jesus says, is not from him. And he offers an exchange. He says, you give him your burden, he'll take yours. And his, that he gives you, is light. What a deal. That's amazing. I love that. And you just go to God and you say, God, I'm going to give you my burden. Why not, why not do it right now? Because we do that in prayer. That's why we end in prayer. We, go to, we, we, we kind of sing up to God and about God. Then we study God's word and he's allowed to speak to us through that. And then we go to God and we say, God, I'm ready to do something about this. Status quo is not acceptable. You come and do something in my life. Let's do that right now. We'll pray. Would you bow your heads? Just if you would, close your eyes, bow your heads with me. And I want to just kind of pray through this balance that we just talked about. Would you say, God, build. I want to build my life on you. Help me to, and then just pray this. Help me to accept my humanity. If I'm playing God, if I'm... Uh, trying to uphold, like Atlas, the universe around me. You say, God, help me to realize I can't meet everybody's needs, solve everybody's problems. Help me to know what I can control, what I can influence, 
and what I have no control or influence over. Then say, God, help me to limit my labor. To observe the Sabbath every week. Not every other week, not every month, every week. To rest my body. To recharge my emotions. To refocus my spirit. Then say, God, help me to adjust my values. I don't want to live a life where I end up making poor choices. Because I can win the world, but if I lose my relationship with you or I lose my spouse or lose my kids, it's not worth it. You say, God, help me to nourish my inner life. To not neglect that, to let that, that dream burn once again. God's birthing new dreams in some of you. Would you give him that space to just birth a new dream in you? Maybe you've run, run that other one, its course, and he's ready to pass on this new dream, birth something new, a new flame. And then say, God, help me every day to have a passion. I'm not being driven, I'm being drawn. I'm being drawn by the passion you've put in my heart. The dream. And I won't neglect that. I will nourish it. Would you commit your schedule to God? Especially if you're a list maker. Say, God, help me to have my ear, one ear open to interruptions. To say, God, is this you? And if it is, I want to be, help me to gracefully change my schedule in the moment. And then say, God, help me to enjoy the moment. There's different seasons in life. Some are more challenging than others. But God, I want to have a relaxed attitude through those. To not miss the joy that you want me to have. Some of you are under a lot of pressure where you're despairing of life. I want to pray for you. Because when I read that verse, for some of you said, that's me. That's where I'm at right now. Heavenly Father, I just pray for each person who is despairing of their life. Maybe it's thoughts of suicide, but it might be also just thoughts of, I wish I wasn't alive. I wish I had lived somebody else's life. I got a bad deck dealt to me. God, I pray that you break into their life. Help free them from that place of torment. Lord, I pray that you, through your sovereign work, you reorganize, you, re you change up things, take away the stress, help them to rebalance, refocus, reprioritize, whatever they need to do. And especially, Lord, bring along people of encouragement to speak words of life, life-giving words into their, into their spirit. Now, as I said, that wheel, the hub, all of the pressure, whatever's in the center, all the things in the spokes, whatever's in the center, that's where we derive our power from. Today, I want to invite you to put Christ in the center. Maybe you did that years ago. Maybe you've never done it. But today you find yourself needing more power in your life. And the power of God is available, but you got to put them in the center, in the hub. And then all of that power goes through every one of those spokes, all those things that we're juggling, all of the pressures. So I want to invite you to just pray a prayer because that's how you put Christ in that center is you invite him through prayer. And I, want to, I actually want to lead you in that prayer right now. If that's you, you're saying, I want to, I'm going to follow you in that prayer to put Christ in the center of my life. Then I want, I want you to let me know about it. With every head bowed, every eye closed, we're just trying to give you your, your space. This is your moment 
to put God first. And if that's you, I want you to let me know and say, Andy, count me in on that prayer. I'm going to pray with you when, you when you pray that prayer, just by raising your hand right where you're at. Would you do that? Just boldly. If that's you, yep, okay, I see that just right where you're at. You don't, just, I can see it. You don't even have to go that high. I see you in the back. Yep. Anybody else? Say, count me in on that prayer. I want to put Christ in the center. I want his power in my life. Okay, put, put your hands down. Pray this prayer. Say, today is my day, God. I invite you in the center of my life. Lord, I give you permission to change things as you see fit. And then this is important. You say, God, forgive me for the things I've done that disappoint you, that don't heed your laws. But today's a new day. With your help, would you say, God, with your help, I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to make the kingdom of God my primary concern. Give me a fresh start, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.